and welcome to Tomorrow Now. Before we get started with our interview, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are our Patreon premiere members. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. And a huge shout out to all of the new premiere members. We've had more premiere members uh, getting added this week than, since I think, believe the history of the show. So welcome to all of our new premiere members. Uh, we also have our Patreon producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And each one of these different levels gets a different reward. So check our different sections over at patreon.com slash tmro to see what kind of reward level you can get. Uh, it starts at one penny and goes all the way up to $10 or more. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Barbara Cohen from the Marshall Space Flight Center. She's the uh, lead of the Planetary Science Group there. Also works on uh, as a principal investigator for a bunch of other projects, including the Lunar Flashlight. So welcome, uh, Barbara, to the show. Thanks, Ben. I'm happy to be here. All right, let's talk about uh, Lunar Flashlight a little bit. First off, it's a really cool name. What is it? <laughs> lunar Flashlight is a very small satellite. Uh, it's about 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 30 centimeters. So it's about the size of two loaves of bread. Um, we call it a 6U CubeSat. Um, in CubeSat worlds, a cube is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And if you stack six of them together, it's six U's or six units. So it's a very small satellite and it's going to go to the moon and we're going to look for exposed water ice. Now, exposed water ice probably only exists in very, very, very cold places, like the permanently shadowed regions of the lunar poles. So we're going to skim over the lunar south pole, and we're going to look for water ice in those permanently shadowed regions. Now, of course, if you just had a camera or a spectrometer that was a passive instrument, you would use sunlight bouncing off of those areas and collect those photons to look at them. Permanently shadowed regions, of course, don't have sunlight bouncing into them. So we have to take an active illuminator. That's our flashlight. So we're taking four lasers with us. We're going to shine them down into those shadowed regions. We're going to collect those photons, and we're going to look at the spectrum that comes back. And water ice is going to absorb some of those photons. So if we get fewer photons back than we sent, and we know that water ice absorbed them, if we get all the photons back that we sent, we know there's no water ice there. And what does that get? Let's say we find some water ice. Uh, I mean, we found water on the moon. Uh, we've looked for different things. A couple times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. So it feels like we've, we've found this before. So what, what does this specific thing get us? Sure. So water on the moon, like water on Mars, we discover it a bunch of times. But actually, scientifically, each one is different. And it means a different thing for people who may want to go there and use those resources. So the water on the moon that we know about now, there's water locked in the minerals, very, very small amounts. That's not something that you're going to be able to crack open a mineral and drink. So it's, it's it's scientifically interesting, but not a great resource. Same for the water that's on the surface that's from the solar wind interaction. So as hydrogen comes streaming in from the sun and it interacts with the silicate mineral, silicates are 50% oxygen, those hydrogens and those oxygens bond and make H2O molecules. But again, one molecule on the surface isn't enough to drink. We do know that at the poles, there are deep deposits of water, ice. Um, we know that from radar measurements. But underneath a meter or more of lunar regolith, and lunar regolith is very hard to dig through. Imagine having to dig in your yard a meter or more. That's a lot of work to do just to get to something. So what we're looking for specifically is accessible water frost that maybe humans could go use in the future. And we could use this for a number of things, um, for potentially drinking, but more likely for like rocket fuel and things like that for habitation on the moon? Sure, absolutely. Anything that you need hydrogen and oxygen or water for. All right. Uh, and possibly other elements too. There may be other things in there mixed with it that you could use, something like methane or ammonia or CO2, anything like that as well. <laughs> also things you probably wouldn't want to drink. Um, uh, uh, what's really interesting about this particular mission is w how it's going up. You're not going up on an Atlas or a Delta. You're actually going right. up on one of the first space launch systems. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, so the Exploration Mission 1 for the Space Launch System is going to be the first time that we check out that whole rocket stack. You might remember a couple years ago we sent the Orion on a Delta as a checkout flight, but this is the first time we're going to stack that Orion on top of the big monster rocket and we're going to send that whole stack out. Orion's going to do a loop around the moon and come back, but while it's doing that, we're going to deploy 13 different CubeSats, actually. So they're in the adapter ring between the Orion and the rocket. There's space in there for a whole bunch of little satellites 
They're all going to be 6U satellites. They're all going to be the same size. But the great thing about going on this rocket is that we get beyond low Earth orbit. We don't get deployed in Earth orbit. And that means you can use low impulse in space propulsion methods to go to different places in the solar system. So we're using green propulsion to go to the moon. Other people are going to be using things like ammonia. There's a mission called NIA Scout that's going to be using a big solar sail to go to an asteroid. So these kinds of things don't have enough propulsion or a lift to get us off the Earth, but they have enough to move us around the solar system once we get out of Earth's gravity well. Actually, that worked out brilliantly because both Shire and Warp 11 asked what kind of propulsion you're using uh, to, to move around. So uh, the, the next question coming up is Space Mike, which says, will you be going into a polar lunar orbit to investigate the poles? Yep, good question. We are going into a polar lunar orbit. That means that we have to spend some time getting into the correct plane. So we do a couple Earth flybys to change our plane get into sort of a polar orientation, get captured into a low energy transfer and spiral down around the pole. And you guys were talking before about how close Juno's getting to Jupiter. Lunar flashlight's gonna get within 20 kilometers of the South Pole. That's pretty sporty. Is that the end of the mission when you're getting that close? Uh, or are you, nope. are you using, you're slinging by at that point? Yeah, we have a very elliptical orbit. And so the Paraloon's gonna be about 20 kilometers and the Apolloon's gonna be about 9,000 kilometers. It's going to take us about 12 hours to do a single orbit, but we're only taking data right over the South Pole. And of course, to get the best signal with a very small laser in a very small satellite, we need to get very close to the surface. What kind of power are you going to be using on the vehicle, and how long do you think it's going to last? Well, we have solar panels um, that power the vehicle, and those will last a good long time. There's no problem with that. Our lasers are powered with standard lithium-ion batteries, actually, and so they'll probably last a good long time, too. We think that um, because we are coming so close to the pole, we get perturbed by the gravitational field of the moon quite a bit, and we'll have to do trajectory corrections pretty much every trajectory. Um, and that's going to uh, deplete our propulsion. We use most of our propulsive force to get into the transfer orbit, to get into the capture orbit. Um, and then we'll only have a little bit left to do these kind of corrections. And when that runs out, that'll be the end of the mission. And what's, do you have any like awesome plans for the end of the mission, like crashing into the moon <laughs> and doing something neat? Well, we are going to crash into the moon. There are restrictions on all missions, of course, as to how you can dispose of the mission. And for lunar missions, we have to have a disposal plan that takes us away from the Apollo historic sites. So we can't just let it crash wherever we want it to. We're going to have to do a controlled uh, litho-breaking maneuver. Um, and so we'll probably do that somewhere around a pole. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be too small, I think, to be seen by any of our orbiting assets. And LRO, our Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we hope will be there, but there's no guarantee that that'll be there at the time to observe it anyway. It won't be observable from Earth. It's pretty small. Would, would L, if LRO yeah. was, if the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was in the right position, would it be able to see it? Or is it, I mean, you're, you're pretty tiny. It's pretty tiny. I think we would have to um, do some before and after imaging. I'm, I'm not sure that it could see it. Actually, a question from uh, one of my co-hosts asking, how much off-the-shelf components, how many off-the-shelf components is Lunar Flashlight using? That's a really great question, and it's one of the reasons I tried to make the distinction in the beginning that Lunar Flashlight and these other satellites are not really CubeSats as we understand them. CubeSats have grown to be an amazing part of um, spacecraft building that even university students can do by buying kits and assembling them and launching them. Um, those kits typically have uh, components that are designed for Earth orbit, right? So we're inside a nice magnetosphere and we don't have a lot of radiation. And once you're in Earth orbit, you don't need a lot of propulsion. So typically they don't have all the things that we need to have. Also, we need a radio that can send and receive an X-band because that's how far away the moon is. We can't use the UHF, for example. So we have a lot of components that are not off the shelf. They are spacecraft components, interplanetary spacecraft components. Um, we hope that things like the radio will become uh, catalog items, these very small components, very small electronics, um, ride hard electronics. So we hope that some of these will become catalog items, but right now they're pretty much custom. So the U part or the CubeSat part of it is really the external envelope and everything inside of it is custom. So taking kind of that concept and the idea of the Space Launch System being able to bring you a lot further than normal, uh, using off-the-shelf components 
and the Space Launch System combined, are you going to be able to go out further using lower cost satellite for other missions? Because I know you do a lot more than just lunar flashlight. Are you looking at these combination of things for things in the future? Yes, exactly. Um, all of these CubeSats are very much pathfinders for doing planetary science with these very, very small buses. I think that um, in our development, what we've seen, some of the um, difficulties that we've had to overcome and some of the challenges that we've had, I think really point to the best use of these satellites as maybe daughter ships to larger missions and sending them into environments where you wouldn't want to send your main satellite. So exactly what you were talking before about Jupiter's radiation belts, you know, maybe you could send some of these into the Great Red Spot as probes. For things like Enceladus, where you've got plumes, maybe you could send one of these through the plume. If you were trying to perturb an asteroid, maybe you could crash one of these into an asteroid and watch from a larger spacecraft bus. So I think these, as daughter satellites, are going to be very helpful and very capable to be able to communicate back to their uh, mother spacecraft rather than communicating all the way back to the Earth, having to bring all their own propulsion, things like that. Now, are you tied to the Space Launch System? Because, uh, you know, rockets with NASA, unfortunately, are tied to politics. We're about to get a new president. <laughs> There's not a zero chance that Space Launch System will be canceled. So can you go on an Atlas or a Delta instead? We have a design guideline to be compatible with other rockets, but honestly, the Space Launch System and the CubeSats are tied together um, because we want to be able to show the capability of the Space Launch System, not just for Orion, but for other payloads and secondary payloads as well. So we're very excited to be a part of the Space Launch System. Uh, talking about communication a little bit further, uh, uh, Kay McCoy asks, uh, does the lunar flashlight use a deep space network to talk to Earth? Or do we have some kind of system to talk in a lunar spacecraft that isn't quite as big as this deep space network? Maybe uh, TDRS, which is the uh, tracking data re uh, relay satellite system, uh, something like that. Or are you just using just regular old antenna, like a really big array on Earth? Right, yeah. So we looked at losing TDRS. A lot of lunar missions have looked at using TDRS as well. Um, there are some very special uh, configurations or geometry that you might be able to use TDRS. We're not in one of them, so we are using the Deep Space Network. We uh, are launching in 2018, we hope. Um, we don't know that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter will be there for us as a relay satellite. So we are having to, we're required to take our own communication to correspond with the or to talk to the Deep Space Network. Is that a problem you're working on solving? Because uh, if you're going to be sending a bunch of CubeSats up, you want these smaller satellites, bringing huge communication arrays isn't going to be something you can do. Are, are you guys working on an um, intergalactic communication network, so to speak? <laughs> um, I don't think so. I know there are plans for the Deep Space Network to keep going and to upgrade its 35-meter um, dishes. We only need the 35-meter dishes for lunar. Um, a lot of universities actually are very interested in having their own um, antennas to be able to talk to their CubeSats, and they already do that. Universities talk to their own CubeSats in low Earth orbit. There are some that would like to upgrade to have that capability to talk to deep space CubeSats as well. Uh, space Mike asks if you have any other lunar missions coming up that are kind of cool. Yeah, so on that uh, same mission, the EM-1, there are a couple other lunar CubeSats. Um, Skyfire um, out of Lockheed Martin is going to make a flyby of the moon and makes the measurements and then go out into deep space. Um, there are two other orbiters. One is Luna Map. There's Luna with an H, like here in Boston, Luna Map. Um, and it has a big H because it's looking for hydrogen deposits. So when we talked earlier, we're looking for the water on the surface. There's also water buried deep underneath, and that, this Luna map is going to be looking for those at very high resolution. So it's going to make a skimming orbit just like ours. It's going to come down very close to the South Pole. You're working on some very, very, very cool things. Where can people go to get more information, not just on Lunar Flashlight, but all the projects you're working on? Well, you can go to the NASA Marshall Planetary website. It's called planetary.mfsc.nasa.gov. I'll say, I was looking at your bio before I let you guys look at your bio, and my favorite line in there is that you're, you're uh, a lunatic at the very right. bottom. I thought that was absolutely <laughs> hilarious. I thought that was brilliant. But I love this. This is great. Uh, That's my license plate, too. <laughs> oh, really? That's fantastic. Well, now I'll know. If we're ever up, uh, uh, up at Marshall Space Flight Center, we'll see. Uh, That's lunatic. Right. You'll All know right. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. Uh, it was a great amount of fun. I hope you won't be, won't be a stranger to the show. And we're looking forward to the launch of uh, SLS on Exploration Mission 1 to watch Lunar Satellite and a bunch of other CubeSats and uh, Orion. It's going to be awesome.
Yep, it'll be great.